Hello, and welcome to the Success Showcase. I'm your host, Eric Lopkin, from the Modern Observer Group. Chip Janiszewski is on vacation this week, but with us is Chris Calandra from Elliott Wealth Management. Chris, how are you doing? I am very good, Eric. Thanks for having me on. I was in thinking about joining you today. I was curious how you were going to handle the opening, because typically, I believe you say, as always, with me is Chip. <laughs> I think you're breaking routine, right? Is this um, this is a change of pace a little bit, not having Chip with you on the show? Little bit. Chip takes vacation once in a while, but I think in the time we've been doing this, it's only the second show I've done without him. Very good. Well, I'm honored to be on. I know I have big shoes to fill with uh, Chip being your usual partner, but I'm really excited to join you today. I'm glad to have you. You know, We've talked over the last couple of weeks about goal setting and planning and metrics to use. Today, we're going to take all of that and narrow it down a little bit and see how all of this relates to your financial health. Because whether you're a business person, an individual, we all have to make sure the bills are paid at the end of the day. We've got more coming in than we do going out. And so many people play it by ear. They just sort of fly by the seat of their pants. And that's obviously not the best way to do it. So, Chris, I'm going to toss it to you. How do you start the process of not flying by the seat of your pants when it comes to finances? No, it's it's a good question. And conveniently, having listened to several of your last shows, it ties in with general best practices regarding anything. So much of what is in, uh, involved in the financial elements of your life is not that much different from leading a healthy lifestyle or running a successful business or just about anything else you want to accomplish. So some key things I think are, number one, like lots of different things, is you want to establish goals. and With goal setting, again, common sense, best practice, you want to choose your goals wisely uh, because there's lots of quotations and anecdotes that say, you know, be careful what you wish for because you're likely to get it. And also what you think about and what you write down and what you strive to achieve is going to occupy both your conscious and your subconscious. So choose your goals wisely write them down, and it's best to have goals that are quantifiable. Um, So in the financial world, that could be a day you want to retire or a certain amount of money or uh, an amount of money for a down payment or a second home. It could be an income, but you want the goals to be quantifiable. So first step, establish goals, choose them wisely. Don't do them haphazardly, really think them through. Write them down. In addition to write them down, I probably should have mentioned, uh, Eric, I'm a big fan of when you write them down, it makes sense to share them. If you just write them down and you keep them intensely private, I don't think you get as much mileage out of that as if you share it. If you have a spouse, close family members, to share your goals with them. Uh, If you have a business partner or a business coach, life coach, a trusted friend, I think when you choose them wisely and you write them down, I think sharing is not required, but I I think it's really beneficial because it helps you hold to accounts. And I know for myself, Eric, and I imagine you're like me, I don't like to be embarrassed and I like to be well-regarded and I like to be considered as a sharp guy. So if I share that with someone, and then I don't attain them, I run the risk of being embarrassed or maybe not being taken seriously. So it kind of helps your conscious and subconscious to kind of drive you to the achievement of those goals. And Exactly. Yeah, Yeah, we've actually spoken quite a lot about how important it is to share your goals. When you keep it, you know, to yourself, when everything's internal, you tend to give yourself a lot more slack. Oh, you know, I said I'm going to lose weight. I said I'm going to exercise every day. Well, I didn't tell anybody. 
I'll skip today. Nobody's going to know. But when yeah. you have somebody else involved in that so that they know what's going on, so that they're actively sharing, so that, you know, every once in a while they actually ask you, how's it going? It helps keep you on track. It does. And, and don't you think, Eric, that in addition to the accountable part, I think it is also beneficial because when you say you're going to do something and when you talk about it, even if you're behind on the goal, when you talk about it in that conversation you outlined, you know, that helps your mind to get working creatively about what you should do, what you need to be doing, what you've accomplished thus far, and what you still need to do. You know, that regular interaction, I think, contributes by getting your juices flowing and gets your mind working on the problem at hand. And so in addition to being accountable, I just think the human psyche is such that it really helps you move towards your goal when you just kind of talk about it. I just got back, for example, from uh, a coaching program that I'm involved in that's um, niche in my industry. And so much of what was talked about at this two-day meeting was kind of stuff I've heard before, read before, familiar with the ideas. But I know that I found that just by being in that environment, talking about it, talking with others about goals and best practices and the like, that it really got my creative juices going. And I, I think that's a big part of the sharing of your written down goals. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. People's minds react to different stimuli. So when you're thinking about a goal, that's only activating part of your mind. When you write it, that actually activates a separate part and gets you know, more of your mind engaged in it. When you talk about it or when you see things involved with your goal, those activate even more parts of your mind. So where while you're thinking about it, you're sort of trapped in one part. Writing, talking, listening, visualizing, all activate different parts of your mind and the oh, yeah. more parts you can activate the better off you are because you're thinking more creatively you're thinking more logically it all works together that's absolutely correct and i think too on the quantifiable part you know when you're talking about finance um there's certain people that think in terms of numbers. I know given my profession, being in the financial services industry, I'm a numbers-oriented person. I'm not a creative type in terms of um, pictures and visualization. I'm not artistic. And so even though the goals are quantifiable, for many people that might want to have financial goals they want to accomplish, you want it to be quantifiable but there's nothing wrong with pairing those with some visuals or something that is more embraced in how you look at things and how your mind works. For example, you know, if a goal is to save for your dream home, I'm just using this as an example, well, you could put down, I want to buy my dream home, that's X number of dollars, or you need X number of a down payment, or maybe you have to make a certain amount of money to accomplish that. But I think it's healthy, especially for some people that are more creative types, is you could pair that with a picture of the type of home you'd like to buy. So it's not just the number, which people may not have or may not resonate with people in the same way it might for me. But if you pair it with a picture, whether it's a house or a car, a place on the beach, uh, whatever it might be, then you can match the quantifiable with a visual aid. And that, like you were saying earlier, also activates different parts of how the human mind works and helps you work out problems and get to goals. Absolutely. You have to set your goals in such a way that it motivates you. If you're not a numbers-based individual, one of the best things you can do is to figure out exactly what those numbers represent. So to follow up on your example of your dream house, you can figure out, okay, the house costs X number of dollars. So your goal is that X, but the image is the house. 
you can go, you can furnish the house. So it's, you know, a couch is worth, th it costs this much. A uh, new kitchen costs this much. And you figure out exactly what you want that house to look like, putting it, the cost value to each part. So you're still working towards that goal of X number of dollars. But if you're a visual person, you're looking at what those X number of dollars is actually going to translate into in your life. Yeah, that is, um, that is very, very well said. And I think having read and listened to a lot of folks talking about goal setting, I think the pairing of the quantifiable and the visual isn't emphasized enough because some people, the idea of, uh, I want to have X number of dollars for retirement. If it doesn't provide a picture for them, it, they may not be getting as much bang for the buck that you would think by having a quantifiable goal. So uh, I'm glad I'm glad we covered that. I think once you've established the goals, we talked about choosing them wisely, write them down. Uh, also recommend sharing them with one or more people that can help you be accountable and work through the goals as you work towards achieving them. Have them be quantifiable, but also have some visual aspects to it if that's helpful to you, and for many people it is. Then the next thing is you need an implementation plan. Uh, you know, there's a very popular book, Eric, uh, The Secret, which talks yes. about controlling your mind. If you think about things, they have uh, a high likelihood that they'll happen. And as much as I like that book, and it is very powerful, I don't know what your opinions are on the book, um, you still do need to act. Because no matter how much I might want to sit on the couch at home watching an NFL football game, thinking about checks arriving in my mailbox, it's probably not going to arrive in my mailbox until I actually act. And that's right. You get to the implementation plan of accomplishing your goals. Yes. While visualization and and putting out positive um, attitude into the universe is important, it's a fantastic mindset to have. Nothing is going to happen unless you actually take steps to make it happen. Yes. Um, Nike slogan, just do it, um, really resonates on this subject. Um, you need an implementation plan. So in, in the world of finance, and, and this actually is the same in, in, in how I run my business, um, I don't think you need some 98-page dissertation on your financial plans. I'm also not a fan of you need to write down how much you plan on spending at lunch this week. Um, but you do need a plan. I think you should have a short, elegant, executive kind of summary of what you want to accomplish. And I think this works again, whether you're running business or in your own personal financial uh, component of your life. And uh, I'm thinking three pages or less would be the summary of what you want to accomplish. And so it's not just the goals, but it's the implementation to the goals. So if the goal is, I want to have X number of dollars for a down payment, or I want to have X number of dollars to retire or to buy a vacation home, whatever, is you have that goal, but then this implementation plan would outline what steps you need to take in the short, mid, and possibly long term, what you actually have to do action-wise to get to the goal. Um, and I like to work backwards in many instances, Eric, and I'd love your thoughts on this, but I like to work backwards from a goal and reduce it to more bite-sized doables. If you want to uh, retire, let's say you're 45 years old and you were going to retire at 65 years old with some huge sum of money, that may seem very insurmountable. It may be a big amount of money. And it might not be so bad if you broke it down to what you need to do each week or each month or each pay period in terms of a saving slash investment goal. So part of that implementation plan is to take that big goal, to break it down to its component parts, work backwards to figure out what I need to do today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next quarter 
And if I could do those things consistently, the achievement of that goal almost becomes inevitable. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Many people set these big goals and we encourage, you know, there's a, there's a saying, the big audacious goal. And we encourage people to aim for those huge goals, but the goal as a whole can be overwhelming. So breaking it down is important, whether it's your finances, whether it, I use often use the example of building a website. If you say, I'm going to build a website for my business, many people stop right there because they get overwhelmed. But when you break it down to, okay, I'm going to decide what I want to talk about on the website. I'm going to decide what pages are. I'm going to write the text for a pe the page. And you break it down step by step, it becomes much more manageable. Yeah. And regarding the other thing you had mentioned, I actually know a number of financial folks who all use the same the same saying, and I've adapted it into our coaching programs, it's start with the end in mind. That's and right. one, of the, one of the things we do with our coaching programs, the, the first essentially three exercises, the first one is visualizing where it is you want to end up, what it looks like, what you're doing. Once you've got that, the second is create a description of where you are right now. And that third step is taking those two images, seeing what's missing, you know, that's keeping them from being the same and starting to figure out step by step how to put those missing pieces into the puzzle. For sure. And I will give another example along the same lines is I often meet business owners, you know, that are clients of mine. And I know you deal with a lot of business owners in your role with the Modern Observer Group is um, you meet a business owner and they say, I want to make, and I'm getting, making up numbers, Eric, but I want to make $100,000 more this year as a business owner. Um, but then you should be able to break it down to the component parts is, you know, how many new clients do you need to make $100,000? Let's say they make a profit of $1,000 per client, then they need 100 new clients. And then you could break it down of how many, how many of those new clients do you need each week, each day, each month, or maybe it's a seasonal business where more business comes in in a certain part of the calendar. Um, and then it would be, well, what do you need to do to attract those clients? What do you need marketing-wise? What do you need um, sales effort-wise? What does that mean for the service model? Um, but if you just say, I want to make $100,000, and you just go out and really hustle and work really hard, you may or may not achieve the goal, or you may achieve the goal, and it'll break some other aspect of the business. Right. Um, in the home life, if I say I want to make so much more money than I'm making now, I probably can do that, right? I could work more hours. Currently, I try not to work on weekends. I try and take a lot of Fridays off in the summer. I could probably make more money, but it's going to come at another expense someplace else, in this instance, with my work-life balance. Those are the things you want to work through in terms of the implementation plan. And when you work backwards and you break it down into bite-sized doables, it also allows you to think more thoroughly about what you need to do because having big goals, there are changes that that makes elsewhere. And I believe that helps you become aware of what those will be because you're thinking it out with a purpose and a specific implementation plan will help you not only achieve the goals, but prevent problems that might crop up while you're trying to achieve those goals. You're absolutely correct about that. Whether, you know, we talk a lot about work-life balance, and I often say there's no such thing as a work-life balance because for them to balance, it, it, it sort of creates an us-them. It means there's work and there's life, and the two of them are separate, and you have to balance the two. They're not separate. 
everything you do affects everything else you do. You have a holistic life, and you can't make changes in one part of it without it affecting the whole. Yes, that's it. That's exactly right. Everything is interrelated within the business it is, within your financial life, and then it, it, it broadens out to, you know, family considerations, healthy lifestyle considerations. So I know we're talking somewhat narrowly about financial, and that's, that's great. But there are many people that um, don't want that big house or they may not want to retire early because it might upset some other aspect of their lives. And it's a very personal thing. Um, but by breaking it down to the parts like where we're talking about, to have an implementation part that really lends itself to you thinking through what you want to accomplish, what you need to do, and the corresponding effects on other aspects of your life, which may or may not be what you want to sign up for. Um, so we talked about establishing goals. We have the implementation plan. Again, I like short elegance. I think you should have kind of three primary goals that you work on. The mind seems to prefer to deal with three seems to be a good number. Um, some people do less. Some people do more. Um, but the next thing I was hoping we could touch on, Eric, which I often think gets short, uh, um, it, well, I would say it this way, it doesn't get emphasized enough, is we've established the goals. We have an implementation plan that's in writing. And the next thing is to monitor those results. And you probably know as well as anyone, um, lots of people make New Year's resolutions, but most people have abandoned those by somewhere around January 20th. Right. We talked about this last week where about evaluation metrics and it's very important if you if you don't know where you stand in relation to where you started and in relation to your goal, you don't know when you've achieved it. That's exactly right. And I know um in 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 my business um talking about the financial elements of my business we track 10 key metrics in my business every week. And these are key metrics that drive the achievement of the goals that we have in my uh, practice. Um, and it tracks the success of the implementation plan. If you have an implementation plan and you put it down and you monitor the results and you're not getting the results that you thought you would, it happens in life. It's not the end of the world. Then you've got to go back and amend update your implementation plan, but you have to monitor your results and you need to know the key metrics in what you're trying to accomplish. So uh, I'll give you a few things financial wise is um, I don't think it's bad to have a checklist of up to 10 that would be like what your income is. And if you're self-employed or are in some type of incentive oriented position, you know, that could go up and down. If you're salary remains the same, then you're reduced to annual reviews and regular raises, hopefully, that come with those reviews. But to, but to track those metrics, and you could use Excel, you could use graphics, there's all kinds of apps and technology that you could use depending on how sophisticated and technologically oriented you want to be with this. But I could tell you in my business, we just have a spread spreadsheet. 10 key metrics, we track them every week. We could easily graphic them. On the personal financial front, on the personal financial front, um, you know, let's say that you're trying to get, I've used the example of retirement or saving for a down payment, or let's say, Eric, instead that we're trying to reduce debt. Um, let's say you have some debt, student loans, mortgage, business debt, whatever, car loan, and you want to reduce it. Well, then, to monitor your results, you should add up all the debt, have a line item for each debt. Your implementation plan should call for how you're going to reduce that debt because that's a goal. And then on regular intervals, could be monthly, could be quarterly, depends on the person and the situation, but to see how that debt then is getting reduced. The car loan is going down because hopefully you're making extra payments on it. Um, so you need to monitor results, and to do that, you have to figure out what the key metrics are that drive the achievement of the particular goal. 
That's very true. And I think something that's important for our listeners to really pay attention to is the fact that, you know, we're setting these out in steps, but all of the steps are related. You know, the goal has to be set up in a way that it can be measured. The metrics are the way you measure it. The implementation plan is geared towards accomplishing that goal. The metrics monitor the progress of the plan, and then they tell you when you need to go back and make changes to the plan in order to achieve those original goals. You know, we're putting these as one, two, three, but you really do go back and forth between all of them because all of these parts have to work together. Yeah, absolutely. And I know, um, Eric, to your point, which is a really, really good one, I know in certain instances, I'm talking now about my business for a moment, there are times when I'm monitoring results of what's happening in my business, and that helps me create a goal because something in my business may not be performing in the way that I want or it needs improvement, or it needs fixing, or it will be for the betterment of the practice, it may generate a new goal for me by monitoring the results. So it's not a uniform one, two, three, because sometimes monitoring results could lead to establishing a new goal or an update to an existing goal. And sometimes in the implementation, you could start doing something and realize, wow, this is more important or more key than I originally thought when I set up my goals and while I was monitoring my results. And you could go back to the drawing board. You're right. They don't go in exactly order. changeable. And that flexibility and that attention to detail will really enhance the chances that you achieve your financial goals and have a healthy financial lifestyle. That's it. All right. We're actually coming up on the end of our time. So before we wrap up, I just want to touch base and see once you've once you're monitoring, what do you think is yeah. the next step? Where do you go from there quickly? It depends on the particular goal, but um, once you're monitoring results and you track them and you know your numbers, um, you have to go back and revise your goals and your implementation plan because hopefully you're achieving your goals, you're moving towards the goals, or sometimes you'll set out for a goal and realize, eh, that's not really what I wanted. Um, so I think it's kind of a rinse, repeat kind of process. This is an ongoing kind of thing. Um, so when you monitor your results, I think you just want to revisit your goals, change them, update them, mark them as complete, come up with new ones, and that will require you to revisit your implementation plan. But you have to know what your numbers are and know what improves your numbers, and you'll be in very, very good shape. Yeah, we refer to that as the feedback loop, and it's how you have to react to what's going on. You make the decision, you measure your progress, and you use that information to change direction, enhance direction, whatever you need to do to make yourself move forward. All right, so as we wrap up, what do you think is the one big takeaway you want our listeners to have? I think I would say that in the realm of financial, it could seem very, very intimidating. There's so much information out there that you could have um, paralysis because there's just so much competing information for your mind share when it comes to financial. And lots and lots of people really don't particularly like or enjoy this subject, but it's within your power by just spending a little bit of time coming up with a simple plan after you've established some really good basic goals that are important to you. And then with just some basic monitoring results, it doesn't need hours and hours and hours of your time. You can achieve an awful lot. It's within your power. Um, and you will be so much better off if you do embark on such an endeavor. I think my takeaway for today is people have a tendency to be intimidated by finances. But what oh, we've yeah. What we've talked about today and everything we've gone over is that the same processes that you use to achieve things in the rest of your life 
apply to your finances. There's nothing to be scared of. It's just another part of your life to look at. So take it all together and work through it. You've been listening to the Success Showcase. We're at